Welcome everybody uh, to this press conference. The background might have given it away. You're joining a press conference at the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in Davos 2016. The question we are trying to answer with this press conference today is a serious one, um, even though it's about a very beautiful thing. Um, the question is how can we preserve our cultural heritage? And I'm sure all of you are aware why we're asking this question. We've seen in recent months uh, and read very sad news about what's happening to very important cultural and heritage sites. Um, so it's a timely question to ask. And we're, we're pleased, uh, despite the serious issue, that we're, that we're joined by a wonderful expert panel uh, on cultural heritage. Um, and uh, without further ado, let me, let me start by introducing uh, our panel uh, to you today. All the way down at the end of the panel, uh, but still the number one, uh, we're joined by Lynette Walworth. Uh, she's an artist uh, from Studio Walworth, and she's based in Australia. Um, next to her, we're joined by Peter Salovey, who's the president of Yale University in the US. Right in the middle of the panel, we are joined by Martin Roth, the director of Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, in England. And we're also joined by Richard Kurian, who's the acting provost and undersecretary for museums and research for the Smithsonian Institutes in the US. And last but not least, to my immediate left, uh, we're joined by Nico Desvani, who is uh, leading the forum's uh, engagement in culture and is responsible for the wonderful uh, cultural program we have put together for this, for this annual meeting. So without further ado, Nico, uh, I'll jump to you. Sure. Give us a couple of highlights. Uh, what's what's happening here uh, at the annual meeting, and why is culture such an important issue for a multi-stakeholder platform like the forum? Well, culture and, and cultural heritage being being the topic are, are are critical to the sort of multi-stakeholder engagement that we have at the forum. We try to bring leaders from business, civil society, politics, uh, media, the arts, and I think there's been an understanding from the very beginning of the forum that uh, no conversation really is uh, holistic if it doesn't include uh, a conversation about culture and art. Um, so this has been in the programming for, for the World Economic Forum for many years. We, we actually don't talk so much about a cultural program anymore as just as much a, the sort of cultural component or cultural muscle of, of what is a, a, a broader program on, on geopolitical and other issues. And you know, cultural heritage is not a new topic and, and the folks to my left are, are all experts in the topic, but it's uh, with what's been happening in the last 12 months alone, uh, with the destruction of cultural heritage sites, with uh, some of the effects of climate change, with some of the terrorism uh, in places of culture, in concert halls, in museums, uh, it's w we thought it was appropriate for us to raise the profile, um, see the interconnectedness between culture and the geopolitical context, um, and then to sort of uh, you know try to be uh, our best as the forum being that platform for public-private partnerships so that we can bring people here from different horizons, from the public sector, from the private sector, artists, and various folks who are dealing with this issue uh, outside of the uh, distinctions, uh, the academic distinctions of what might be uh, tangible or intangible, but really that are pushing for a cultural progress and cultural change, and so that the forum can be an important platform to, to generate those kinds of connections. Thank you, Nico. Richard, uh, over to you. You're the Smithsonian Institutes, you always have people coming back from the US uh, and, and saying, oh, these museums are all for free. This is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But talking about the cost and the very serious cost, what are we losing? Uh, what are we losing at the moment? What is, what is the damage to our cultural heritage that we're, that we're looking at at the moment? Well, it's coming from a variety of sources. As we've talked about, uh, you have the purposeful destruction of cultural heritage sites, monuments and collections, the burning of books, for God's sakes. But uh, there's also the changes happening because of climate change, where uh, we have uh, various heritage sites and so on around the world being uh, threatened by that, acid rain, pollution. In some cases, cultural heritage is very significant because it yields economic benefits. Tourism, many people go. It generates huge economic force within many societies. Sometimes it's too popular and those tourists are actually helping destroy those sites or undermining those sites. I think when we lose cultural heritage, whether it be a site, a collection, a monument, or even intangible cultural heritage like musical traditions or languages being lost at the rate of several, several dozen a year, we lose part of humanity's cultural DNA. 
And that DNA is not only something to put in a museum, as Martin and I put it in museums and enshrines it, but it's also something that provides kind of the cultural DNA for the future, because heritage is really a record of human creativity. And so when you lose that, you lose the ability to use that for cultural industries, for education, for new inspiration and creativity. And when you see purposeful destruction, as we're seeing now in the, in the, in the Middle East, then you see a destruction not only of kind of the economic consequences or the educational consequences, but really the civic consequences, the loss of respect for diversity of humankind, a lack of tolerance, a, a kind of sense of the world that uh, is very restrictive that I don't think we want to live in. Thank you. Martin, um, he mentioned that, that you're enshrining things in museums, uh, but, but, I'm, uh, but I'm sure there's, there's more you can that. do <laughs> without, well, <laughs> Richard said it. Um, so, but there's, there's, there's more. I mean, you're not, just, you're not just doing this, but you're also the experts on the subject matter. So is there a silver lining? What can you do without going into too much detail? Because I know some of these things are sensitive, but what can you do to, to help preserve the, the cultural heritage? Yeah, thank you. But in, just to, to start with, maybe a kind of very general comment in the beginning, I think it's an extremely difficult topic because in a very certain way, we are, a very strange way, we are shocked, always shocked. There's an emotional impact. Mm -hmm. But at the, same at the same time, we're used to iconoclasm. I mean, <coughs> I used to work in Dresden. Um, I'm now in a, in a city affected by the Blitz. You know, we, we talk always about what happened in other parts of the world. We are still part of, of it's part of our mm -hmm. culture and, and civilization. I think that makes it so complicated. So it's a topic that's very close to us. And at the same time, it's a very difficult topic because it's far away. Mm -hmm. And just to underline what Richard said, I think it's definitely, he's absolutely right. It's, it's a variety of topics from emerging cities, exploding cities, loss of memory, um, tourism and, and much, much more. But it's also not only objects, it's pride, language, and so on, part of the museum's history. For the V&A, and I think that makes it even more complicated, the V&A worked with Syria for at least 160 years. We started to collect in the Middle East immediately when the museum was founded. So how can we stop working with our colleagues in Syria today in those difficult times? Um, how can we stop to work with our colleagues in, in those difficult times? So we had a conference together with Yale a few months ago, and we asked our colleagues in Syria on Skype, what can we do exactly? And they said, I will never forget that, they said, do your homework. And homework means mm. stop illicit traffic, talk to the dealers, talk to lawyers, talk to the Ministry of Defense. So I think it's not only what we can do and what Richard said rightly, on site, it's also what we can do in our countries, mm -hmm. in our societies, and changing or creating awareness. It's a question of education and working with those who are part of it. I mean, we can talk about a lot of um, things that are happening right now on site, and I really recommend it. I just always a bit worried if we add fact to fact to fact, because that's not enough. We need a kind of overarching solution and we need definitely guidance and leaders in that field who combine all of us we need we need more giant strategies for the future thank you um peter um he, uh, your your predecessor mentioned education so what can you do at yale what are you doing at yale to to raise the awareness for for that for that issue and is the awareness high enough yeah, or? thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to address that question and of course I think all of us feel honored that the uh, uh, World Economic Forum uh, is providing a vehicle by which we can talk about these issues. Uh, uh, I think um, in, in part answer to your question, educating the world's leaders uh, about the importance of uh, uh, preservation of cultural heritage, uh, I think uh, 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 is a significant opportunity. We appreciate that opportunity. So uh, let me talk personally a little bit and then, and then talk about my institution just for a couple of minutes. Uh, I'm uh, uh, the president of Yale University and I'm a psychologist. And so I'm not out in the field uh, 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 preserving cultural heritage or working on doing research on cultural heritage. But as a psychologist, I understand, I think, what cultural heritage represents for people. Uh, it's a part of their identity. Uh, it's a part of their understanding, both of themselves, but also, also 
themselves as a member of a group uh, or a culture. And so when um, that is threatened, uh, whether by um, uh, civil unrest, deliberate uh, destruction and warfare, or uh, climate change or acid rain or other uh, natural uh, destruction, uh, let alone the impact of tourists and others, you're, you're actually, um, uh, you know, at minimum trampling on people's identity. But when it's deliberately um, uh, uh, destroyed, as we've seen uh, by the Taliban or ISIS or what have you, uh, you know, that is a kind of psychological uh, 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 terrorism, really, uh, uh, that, that is occurring. So how do we join together uh, and resist this? It's going to take international solutions, uh, uh, not just uh, 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 one-off uh, defenses. Now at Yale, we're really very interested in education and scholarship on these issues. I'm really here representing the Institute uh, for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage, which is a group on our campus headed by uh, Stefan Simon. And uh, it includes scientists working on the, the chemistry of the materials uh, that are threatened. Uh, it is, uh, uh, includes uh, people uh, who are actually artists working on preservation projects, whether it's textiles or paintings or sculpture or or a mosaic or what have you. Uh, we have uh, folks from computer science working on digitization. How can you preserve through digitization, make available uh, to the word, world? Uh, and of course, we have uh, uh, people working on legal issues, public policy issues, uh, and the like. And our, our uh, uh, goal is uh, not uh, just finding and protecting cultural heritage, which is of course important, uh, but also studying and understanding and giving future leaders for all um, uh, sectors of society throughout the world, that's how we think about our students, right? Giving those future leaders some understanding of these issues uh, so that they will uh, engage with them uh, long after their students at Yale and when they're uh, the kind of people that are invited uh, by the World Economic Forum to conference every year. 2050. Exactly. Thank you very much. Lunette, you bring a, a unique perspective to this panel because you are an artist. Uh, the gentlemen are preserving, they're studying art, you create art. Um, so if you, if you see what's happening to, to these cultural heritage sites, to these unique uh, parts of our history and cultural history, how do you feel about that and, and, and how, how does that change how you think about your own work? Um, I I think about culture um, from that perspective of the living thing that you need to keep to make bread. You know, those those the essence that you have to keep alive by tending to it. And in those places where something is being destroyed that has been created by an act of imagination, I think what we need to keep alive then is the people who knew that work because they hold it in their memory. And people, again, will make something new from that memory. Um, this work I have brought here has a relationship to atomic testing. There are people in Japan who are handing their stories on as living memory, their experience of Hiroshima. They hand on in form of story to a person who preserves that tale. And they spend years and years learning how to speak that story exactly as that person told it. And I think when the objects go, the objects are just a mirror of what we imagined. And if the objects go, we have to keep alive the people who knew them, preserve their memory in some way, let them tell that story. We need to, I would think, you know, my instinct would be to go and s capture the sense from those people of what that object meant so that it remains alive in some form, not physical form, but in spoken word. Thank you very much. And uh, before we open the floor for question, um, the theme of the annual meeting is the fourth industrial revolution. Let's, let's take a quick look at technology. How can technology, the new technologies we have, virtual reality, for example, help preserve cultural heritage? Could that be one way to, to also add to, to preserving the sense uh, of that cultural past? Please. 
Okay. In this is. God asking me is really rather difficult. Yes, sure, absolutely, yes, no doubt. I mean, it's uh, it's the digital technology. I think it's much, much more. And if I start talking, Nico will stop me because I always feel like in, on a mission, and I did it already last year. <laughs> you know, if you bring, we have this, uh, we have this amazing, amazing opportunity, probably the first time, that we combine the real and the digital, the authentic piece and the, the digital conversation about it. You can object, mate, talk to each other around the globe. So I think that's exactly what we have to do right now. But it's not only 3D printing, um, digital replica. I mean, we saw a lot of great things. It's really, how to say that, supporting the aura of the real. And uh, I think that we will see a lot of amazing things in the near future. But I mean, I wouldn't be a museum's person looking, I mean, in the future without going to the past. And if you come to the V&A and you see those amazing replica, the so-called cast courts, looks a bit like Jurassic Park of culture. <laughs> um, all those objects there, the genetic, it's you, Richard, it's your DNA, the DNA code of culture. Then, you know, it's also, I mean, it, it's an old idea to preserve culture in that way, but it's absolutely the future, definitely. Yeah. I think we're talking about experiences, you know, as people come to museums or other places. We are talking about recording now, doing, you know, holographic recordings of people's memories where you think about doing it, we're doing it in the United States with leaders of the civil rights movement. We have to do it with astronauts. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, this cultural heritage is not only in the past, it's pretty close to us. And it, as Martin said, it's, it's, it's near to us. So I think we're looking at better techniques for both documenting and presenting. We're approaching the thing of taking the treasures. Many people, we get about 30 million people that come to the Smithsonian every year that visit the museums. But now with 3D technology and scanning, we're creating the, the, the ability to you can push a button anywhere in the world and get the Smithsonian's collection mm -hmm. and print it out. If you're printing out the space shuttle, you better hit the reduce button before you print it out. <laughs> so I, I think these, are, but, but to go back, you know, there's, there's also a core, because it's not only the technological toys that we love to play with and, and the prospect, is what does that do on the ground to people? And Martin mentioned, for example, you know, having Skype, you know, discussions with people in Syria and Iraq who are on the ground locally trying to do exactly what Lynette said. And, and because they do have the memory and the knowledge. So we're doing a lot of training in areas where maybe we can't get to physically. We're doing a lot with monitoring a lot by satellite and social media so we can document and understand the patterns of destruction and endangerment. And there we look for uh, scholars at Yale and other universities to really do long time studies of these data sets that we're getting that are eventually you know, converted into digital information that we can then understand and be able to predict when things are going to come under threat and struggle, whether from human conflict, natural disaster, or long term natural processes. So there's a lot happening, and I think a lot of institutions represented here on the panel represent this coming together of many people trying to tackle this in a much bigger and more formal way than we ever had in the past. Yeah, I, th I think uh, it's interesting when we think of innovation in this world, in this area, there is no doubt that there is technological innovation, the kinds of imaging techniques that can be used now much, much more advanced just in the last decade. Uh, 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 the, um, uh, you know, and that has, that, uh, much of that has uh, been based on the work of um, uh, computer scientists in academic settings, for example. But you know, this is an area where innovation can equally privilege uh, both science and art. Um, you know, uh, it is a place where, uh, for example, yeah, collections of uh, artifacts and archives are worked on by scholars, you know, with a, with a goal to understand these materials and to study them in new ways. Uh, another way, you know, the, the advances in material science uh, have been huge in this area and uh, are being used every day in the, uh, at Yelp. We have two laboratories focused on this. But as they're doing that kind of scientific work, scholarly work, uh, they're also interacting with artists themselves, with conservators, with people who actually make this material come alive. And uh, I think um, at the end of the day, you end up uh, with a community of people who um, care deeply about uh, both the making of art but also the creation of culture. And uh, yes, innovation and yes, technological tools 
uh, have uh, changed the nature of the work, uh, but it, there's still a very human collaboration uh, underlying all of this. Thank you, Peter. Martin, you want to react to that? Oh, Honestly, okay. oh sorry. Yes. I was saying, Martin always, always uh, you know, has a beautiful way with words, and I think to say the aura of the real is um, a wonderful way to describe what technology can do now. Um, this work that the World Economic Forum helped me make um, has come from a very remote community, very, very remote community, and the technology is allowing that storyteller within that community to send a story out in terms of the issues around tourism, also just around cultural destruction, which occurs from people going in and impacting, as we all do, you know, our presence changes everything. The ability to, the technologies that we have now, virtual reality technologies, for example, to give a sense of place without being in that place is a gift, is a gift in terms of cultural heritage, I think, because it means you can give sense of presence without having to impact the place. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that, Kamler and Linda. really like that. Um, the, I think there's a, there's a very difficult dimension, and the difficult dimension means, yes, there is innovation. We need new technology, everything, but we need also a completely different social, um, social approach. Think about all the refugees in Europe now. And there are a lot of, what, what, what we have, a lot of education programs for that refugees. I think it's more the, bit the other way around. I think we have to listen to those refugees. There are a lot of skilled artists. There are a lot of skilled workers. There are people we used to work with. We don't work with them right now. So we started to build uh, an, another network of museums, but I hope it will help. Network of design museums, applied art museums, meet in Oslo next week, just to think about how we can work with the refugees. But again, not as education programs, more to bring them in the museum and know from them um, learn from, sorry, learn from them, expertise, knowledge, build another group called SOM, Museums, Security and, and Curators working together in a European scale. So what I mean without this, how to say that, without human relations, without a, um, a, a sensitivity for what's going on, a political sensitivity, innovation will not help. We need both. Very good. Thank you. Nico, um, uh, our panel has been has been a bit shy. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, private sector and, and political sector leaders here. Um, if the panelists are too shy to to give their wish lists to them, what do you think? Uh, what do you think should be the message that we're giving to the CEOs here, to the to the more than forty heads of state? How can they support the work of our panelists? Oh, we are not shy. Yeah, nobody's we're shy about that. It's not a very shy group. <laughs> actually. Um, certainly not privately. Um, <laughs> Like I think the message um, is, uh, you, you know, the forum brings together stakeholders as a platform, and it's a complex issue. It's, it's actually you can look at cultural heritage as a way to organize the world. I mean, you can look at all of the topics of society through that topic, since culture is so formative to who we are, how we come together, how we understand our own place in the world. So. Uh, the extent to which we can uh, continue to raise awareness not only of the urgency of what's happening, but also on a more human level, as we're talking, for example, of the fourth industrial revolution, the implications of ever faster interconnectivity, what is it that keeps us and makes us human? Um, you know, the virtual reality is such an interesting tool because it's new uh, and the novelty of it, and in the, the case of Lynette, because it's combined with world-class storytelling, really, catches people's attention. But it's hard to catch people's attention now and it's hard to get into that place of empathy because of the, the sort of interconnected society we're in. So it's, it's twofold, both I think for us to come together as a community to see how across sectors we can actually contribute, um, but also to be reminded of the very fundamentals uh, of what culture is and how it frames pretty much uh, every decision that we end up making. Thank you. I mean, do you want to have a wish list? Please I mean go ahead, this, a, is, this a really is your chance. A very, really, very short one, I mean, and it's just part of it. I talked to Sabine von Scholem uh, this morning to pr as a kind of preparation for the meeting. She's about to publish a book in a few months on the challenge, the background is law, on the challenge for the UN working with countries in crisis. I mean, what we need, for example, just in Europe, is the kind of, we need rules, we need rules and, 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 it's a, even a kind of juristic system that is that is accepted by all different countries in Europe. 
Um, we need more help for the experts on site, definitely, and that means the UN and UNESCO supporting us. What we also need is a debate, a kind of philosophical debate. Right now it's always, how do you translate it? It's always the human before the cultural object. I mean, is it really true? I mean, if you destroy culture, you destroy human beings. So how do we define that in a different way? Um, we need support for Den Haag. Um, nobody's talking about Den Haag right now, but what, what does it mean in terms of crime and how do we, um, and so on. Um, and last but not least, and I think it's an extremely important topic talk to the, talking to and working with the ministries of defense. What about embedded people from the cultural sectors mm. in military forces? I'm definite, definitely a pacifist, but I mean, at least let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. I would add one more, uh, which is um, figuring out ways to reduce demand for looted uh, goods from uh, uh, cultural heritage sites. Uh, uh, you know, Yale uh, uh, scholars worked for many years at, at uh, Dura Europis, and uh, it's a good example of a uh, uh, of a of a site that uh, that is that has been looted and uh, through um, you know, uh, in some ways through organi in an organized way, not just uh, through banditry, uh, but uh, in, in a way that's. Uh, state supported or at least not state discouraged. Um, and then, uh, you know, public policy can be used to uh, uh, make it very difficult to sell these objects and, uh, 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 and, and reduce demand uh, uh, too. So, uh, you know, we, we, we mostly emphasize warfare, natural disaster, climate change, uh, but there's also uh, other kinds of deliberate human actions uh, that are uh, threatening these sites as well. Well, we can ask you know, corporate leaders and government heads to give more money to fund <laughs> this actual work. And there's a lot of good work. And, uh, you know, internet, intergovernmental agencies like UNESCO are very poor. They don't really have money to do the job. Most cultural agencies in most countries of the world are really impoverished and have nowhere need. And I, I, I would say for, you know, the corporate sector and government sector to consider, I mean, here we have a global economic forum. A number of the threats dealing with heritage in the world today come about mm -hmm. as a result of globalization, whether it be of economic forces and industrialization in places, displacement. Doesn't mean it's all, all, all right. I mean, and we know the benefits of, uh, of globalization, but there are consequences. And one of the consequences we're seeing is rebelliousness against some of the orders, the values of the, uh, of uh, uh, maybe what people associated with uh, the West and uh, uh, modernity. We see displacements of people. So I think this is kind of the other side of the coin, and this is the side of the coin that pays off maybe with some economic benefits, but it pays off mostly in terms of our ability to respect, I think, the diversity of people and cultures on the planet. And so to me, there, there, you know, there is an investment quality uh, uh, to it. If, if you look what we put into the Red Cross and Doctors Without Borders, we're, we're, you know, we know about the health consequences. We need like culture without borders. And we need mm -hmm. money to support that. We need the organizations to support that. We need government agreements to support that. And we need really boots on the ground that are trained and working very closely with people in communities who have a ton of knowledge and right now are often shut out because they don't have the ability uh, to communicate back. So uh, I think there's a lot for people to do. And it's not, only, it's not only having something like, or installing something like culture without borders, it's, and that's exactly what we do for quite a long time right now, work with Médecins Sans Frontières, working with Doctors Without Borders to learn from their experience because it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to work in different silos. It's mm -hmm. all the, the cooperations that we need. Thank you very much. Mindful of the time, um, I'm scanning the room. Do we have any questions? No, the, the room, well, I, I know now that my panel is not shy. The room seems to be shy. So um, it's now time to thank my panel. Thank you very much for all sharing your insights. This has been fascinating, very interesting. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very thank you. much.